So uh, I'm Phil Estes. I'm going to be your uh, track MC for the day, for better or for worse. Uh, I'll try not to steal too much of Tim's time, but he is um, somewhat new to MetLife. Been there for about a year, made a transition from the semiconductor industry to insurance. And I think uh, if you enjoyed the MetLife talk in the keynote, you're going to enjoy uh, a lot more details about their journey. And there's going to be a lot of great sessions here today. So uh, I've been a speaker at DockerCon before. It can be a little nerve wracking. So please welcome Tim Tyler to the stage. Thank you. Um, they have a new button, so uh, based on what we practiced with. So uh, there we go. So yeah, I, I'm Tim Tyler. Um, I'm, a, I'm an engineer with MetLife, and I've been involved in MetLife's journey from basically um, nothing to a production Docker environment with production applications, customer facing applications running in that environment. And we did it in five months. So zero to 60 with Docker in five months. How a traditional Fortune 40 company turns on a dime. And this was my alternate title. Um, and this has been in the deck for a while, I think which is kind of ironic now. How to boil an ocean with a team that has no limits. And after the uh, keynote today, I feel bad because now I know that PETA has a problem with, with Moby and I want to boil an ocean. So I'll have to take this out. Um, this was actually, got, uh, this is anti-guidance though, like an anti-affinity, uh, because Aaron Hustledge with Docker specifically told us back in July, don't boil the ocean. Now I know why. Um, so what to expect from this talk? I'm going to talk about MetLife's journey and I'm, you know, we're hearing that word more and more throughout the conference, I think, especially this morning, um, where we're focusing more on enterprises. But we're gonna, I'm going to talk about MetLife's journey from literally nothing in terms of microservices and Docker and a containerized environment, even formal C, CI and CD and, and continuous release processes. Uh, we went from nothing to not only something, but to a customer-facing production environment. I'm going to talk about a few of the stories that occurred along the way. I'm not going to talk about all of them because there's not enough time. I'm going to talk about the ones that I know a lot about. Uh, so hopefully they'll be helpful for you guys and spark some conversations. And, and we can talk about them later. We saw this slide in the keynote. Uh, I won't belabor it too much. MetLife is a big old insurance company and our products are our promises. And our promises are digital. And our promises can live for a long, long time. They can live for an entire lifetime before we actually have to deliver on those promises. So the data that we're dealing with and many of the systems that we're dealing with are really old, as Aaron noted in his keynote this morning. We're a $57 billion company and we're global and we operate in, I think, somewhere around 50 countries around the world. Next year is our 150th anniversary and we're very regulated, not only domestically, but around the world as well. We have to honor data sovereignty laws all over the world, including in the US, and we deal with lots of legacy systems. As you can imagine, this means that velocity of development and velocity of delivering solutions to customers that meet the extremely dynamic needs of today's consumers is very challenging for a company like that. We're facing a mobile first economy. We're facing an economy based on API calls and the internet of things. And we have to move fast to do that. We can't spend two years developing a cell phone app that by the time we deliver it has been obsoleted and outcompeted by our competitors. And we know that and we knew that you know, a year ago and probably even two years ago. And last year we took steps to address these concerns. Uh, that, that wasn't supposed to happen. You're getting a foretelling here, so uh, I'm sorry. So we went from this, which is nothing. This is still not the right slide. We went from this, which is nothing, to this. And this is just the standard drawing that, that we see throughout the conference. Uh, you know, what's, a, what's the life cycle of, a, of an image? What's the life cycle of a container? What's CI, CD? There's nothing special about this other than that for MetLife, this represents a level of complexity in our engineering, AD or application development and operations environment that, that we have not had before and that we've introduced in the past five months. So we started out 
essentially by building a team and saying, go fix this, go figure this out, go understand what microservices means and what containers means and how we're going to build up this production environment because we only have five months to do it. So we said, wow, okay, let's build a cluster. And we just started jumping right in, getting our hands dirty and figuring out what is Docker all about. And we threw out the traditional uh, design approaches that, that we had previously had. And specifically, we tossed out Waterfall. Uh, we said, you know, what, we have a project plan, we know where we're going, but we don't know exactly how we're going to get there. We know what the scope of the activity is that we're going to do, but we can't necessarily articulate the, specific, the specifics of that scope, at least, you know, back in, back in June or July uh, when we started this. We knew what our requirements were, but we knew that we were going to have more requirements. We knew we were going to learn things along the way over the following five months that we had no idea uh, the result of what uh, those new requirements would be. And then we, we said, what are phase gates, basically? And we ignored those. Uh, we, we got away from, you need to fill out this form and open a ticket and go through all this bureaucracy just to get something done because our velocity needed to be so high. So we built a team. And we called the team the Mod Squad. And uh, I've heard a myth that mod means MetLife on Docker. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Uh, but it's a cool name, and uh, people liked it. It resonated with people. And, you know, kind of in the, in, the, uh, in the spirit of the Phoenix Project, our whole goal was to move fast and to fail fast and to be agile. And we adopted daily stand-ups, which was kind of new to MetLife. And we adopted a scrum methodology. Uh, at the time, we weren't using Kanban boards, but now we are. Just last week, we kicked off the new phase of our uh, of our you know, development or engineering development life cycle, and we're, we're putting up Kanban boards now. But we did have a big wall that we used to move stickies around on all the time, which is essentially uh, Kanban. Um, we were tasked with bringing in disruptive technologies and challenging the status quo. And that's basically what we did. So we, we built this cross-functional team, and it was amazingly diverse. And uh, uh, as my MC said, I've only been with the company not even a, a year. Uh, my third day on the job was when I joined this team, the Mod Squad. And I have to admit, my first two days on the job, I was a little bit like a deer in the headlights because the insurance industry is really different than the semiconductor industry. Uh, and uh, then they said, go down and start working with this team because, you know, we, one of the reasons we hired you was because you've got background in some of the stuff that we're working on down there. And I went down. And it was like the angels started to sing. And I said, this is awesome. This is where I can work. This is where I can make a big impact. The team was really focused. And the team was incredibly diverse. We had folks like me that had just started at MetLife. And we had folks that had been in their career at MetLife for 20 years. We had, we had folks that were junior engineers just out of college starting to contribute on this team. And we had, we had folks like me that had been in, in engineering and information technology for 25 years. We had uh, a, a, an amazing racial and ethnic and uh, a mix of people. There was, a, I think it's 50-50 um, male versus female. It was just incredible uh, how, how diverse this group was. And we built an area to work in. And we worked shoulder to shoulder on these big monitors. We encouraged people to come and essentially relocate their office to this area, and we solved problems on demand. We almost never had meetings that would take up an entire day. Instead of meetings, when we ran into a problem, we would just get together and solve it and work it out. And everybody was empowered to make decisions, knowing that those decisions were probably going to be binding and probably going to be sticking around for a heck of a long time. And, and that's what happened. We were challenged to throw out all the rules, and we did, which was really easy for me because I didn't know what the rules were. And we were challenged to shake up the culture and the hierarchy, and we did that too. And there was a lot of storming and norming that occurred over the course of those five months, not with the mod squad, but with the mod squad and some of the functional teams that we needed to work with uh, to get things done. But we had great leadership. And, you know, they, they ran in front of us with, uh, with a machete and, and knocked any barriers out of the way and did a wonderful job enabling uh, this team to, to meet this goal of five months. One of the things we did was bring in open source uh, to, 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 uh, to MetLife. And this is something that, as, as uh, my colleague Aaron noted, uh, MetLife had previously had an allergic reaction to. 
Uh, but you know, we said, what the heck? Uh, these are things that we need. So we brought in RabbitMQ and Redis. We brought in Docker, of course. We're using Docker Data Center. I should, I should probably caveat. We're using Docker Data Center version 1.12 in classic mode for our first five month production deployment. Um, we're now looking forward to 17. Dot whatever the latest is uh, in swarm mode. And that's our, the next phase of our activity. We also um, we brought in Git and kind of introduced this notion of uh, you know infrastructure as code. And, and not only should our application development teams be using a version control system like Git, but our engineering teams should also learn how to manage their artifacts in in a version control system like Git. We brought in Spring Boot and Netflix and MongoDB. Uh, we brought in Prometheus and Grafana uh, for our, our our monitoring solution, and we're really proud of the work we've done in that space. Uh, it was uh, not trivial. Uh, and in some cases it was very disruptive. Some of our teams are still kind of grappling with what does this mean to have open source? We've always bought really expensive things from really big companies and we could have those big companies on the phone in five minutes if we're in a war room fixing a problem and that's not necessarily the case you know, with open source. Who are you going to call? Maybe you're paying a third party to provide some consulting services, maybe not, but even if you are, they probably don't have a one hour SLA unless you're paying them a whole lot. So we've got some cultural issues that we're addressing, uh, some cultural barriers that we're addressing with respect to open source and making it more of a mainstream solution and approach to solving problems at MetLife. Uh, one that drives me crazy is it's, 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 it's some guy in a garage. I hear that over and over. and, and um, uh, it's almost offensive to me. It's some guy or gal in a garage, so it can't be good is kind of the, the other side of the implication when I hear it anyway. And I, I try to you know, educate people and say it's not just somebody in a garage. It's somebody that's passionate about what they do, that has built a community around what they do and are willing to help you and willing to, to step up and make sure that you're successful if you choose to use their tooling. And these are things that we're working on uh, at MetLife. Uh, I'm working with some colleagues on proposing, you know, a plan for how we handle MetLife, soup to nuts at MetLife, and what that governance model would look like and what that organizational model would look like. Uh, so that's still a work in progress. That's something that, uh, um, you know, we, we have not been completely successful at yet, but I think we're going to be, uh, and we're moving forward with these proposals. Another story is process and procedure. Uh, this is another one that we haven't completely solved yet. Um, we started out uh, and, of course, didn't have any process and procedure because we didn't have anything. Uh, and we knew early on we need to wrap some detail around what the heck are we going to do with Docker files? How are we going to onboard images from Docker Hub or from our application development teams into our internal um, Docker trusted registry? How are we going to manage compose files and the life cycle of those files from application development to engineering, uh, those might even be reversed, to, uh, to, to our operations team and who gets to touch them and who gets to modify them? Who gets to add labels because somebody needs a new finance code, you know, or somebody needs a new chargeback code? Uh, this is something we identified early on and we have some really good ideas and some good recommendations on what we should be doing, but this is an area that, you know, if I had to go back in time, I would have said, okay, we need to apply more effort to this earlier on. And probably most of this work would not have come out of our Mod Squad team. The concepts would have, but we should have done a better job, I think, partnering with our functional teams that would, would have been much better prepared to help us build a governance model around you know, these soft artifacts that are popping up as a result of this new model uh, with Docker and microservices that we're adopting. The sweat the little stuff. I can't stress this one enough. And in almost all cases, we were really lucky that we did, and we did early on. I remember uh, in, in July or August last year, we, we, we were sitting down and saying, okay, you know, we're going to need to label and annotate and apply metadata to this environment because our monolithic app is suddenly, you know, 50 individual bits of business logic floating around in this pool of resources and this is probably going to be hard to manage. And at the time we didn't even know how hard to manage it was going to be. 
Um, but we made some good choices and you know, we took some shots in the dark and said, okay, we probably need a label for the geocode because we're in the cloud and we probably need a chargeback label and oh, maybe it'll be neat, right, if we put a label on our, our, um, our services indicating how many of those services are supposed to run in the environment, at least initially. Um, and that seemed like a trivial label at the time, but five months later, when we were doing our operational handoff, I remember meeting with one of our operations guys, and he asked me, he says, how am I supposed to know how many of these things are supposed to be running? You know, how am I supposed to know if there's too many or too few? And I said, oh, I have, a, I have metadata for that. And I pointed him to our, our graphical interface, the universal control plane, which is, you know, part of the enterprise edition, and said, look, you can just drill down here, in this user interface and you can see, oh, the expected count is three or four or five or whatever it is. Um, and good for us, we had alerts that would come out too and basically let them know, hey, there's fewer than the number of these things that we want running, uh, actually running. Uh, so um, um, we, we did a lot of good work there and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty, pretty proud of the work we did uh, on the metadata and annotation front. We have a convention, com.company.docker.something.helpful that we try really hard to follow, although we're not universally successful at following that convention yet. I do recall though, uh, I was sitting down one day, because we built an audit tool to audit the environment, because there's so much stuff just floating around running randomly everywhere. Um, and we wanted to look at it, you know, in a big visual spreadsheet or a dashboard, uh, just with respect to ensuring that the labels were applied properly and, you know, that everything was set up the way we expected it to be set up, that the machines were built right. So we had this audit tool, and I was looking through um, the images and, and, and some of the uh, labels that were popping up were just one word labels like build and release. And I, I thought, wow, you know, I, I understand that some of the labels don't follow our convention, but they're at least understandable. But these single word labels, they're completely ambiguous. And I thought somebody, either our engineering team, maybe even our mod squad team or our application development team had, you know, just plugged in these, these labels that meant nothing at all and uh, uh, proceeded to think about who I needed to talk to about that and realized it wasn't us at all. It was actually coming uh, from a vendor supplied, a vendor sourced base image and the, those ambiguous labels were from our vendor and they're still there today and tickle my OCD um, on a pretty regular basis. So little stuff is a big deal is kind of the punchline there. Uh, this is something that I'm really passionate about now. Test, 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 and then test some more. And then when you've done all that, test it all again. We built a culture early on of what I like to call test-driven engineering. Um, obviously, I'm speaking to you from the point of view of an engineer and not a, a, a developer, if that isn't clear yet. Um, and so test-driven engineering isn't something that's always, um, you know, front and center. And we, we kind of started down that path pretty early on because we were bringing up things that we didn't know a lot about, like Redis and MongoDB and RabbitMQ, we started building tests for those. My boss said, hey, I'd like to see red lights and green lights for this stuff to see if they're really working and doing what we think they're doing. So we started doing that, building unit and functional tests for the open source in the environment. And, and that was sort of the, the, the kernel of testing for, for what we did over the next five months. And it grew into this big thing uh, that we continue to evolve and, and, and work more on today. Uh, we took that basic red light, green light stuff, and we did it in Bash, and I wanted to commit it to Git, but I was so unhappy with the state of the code because we did it so fast. There was just so much technical debt embedded in it that I chose not to. Um, but I think I know what we're going to do going forward, and I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, we, we then built in our own chaos monkey type testing where we put together a big spreadsheet uh, of test cases. And then, all, and then a whole bunch of tabs for the, that list of test cases. And all of the tabs were essentially different failure modes. And we went old school on this on purpose. It was entirely intentional. Uh, because what we wanted to do, we wanted to accomplish three things. We wanted to test the environment, we wanted to break it and test it and break it and test it and break it again and test it. So we'd fail a worker node, we'd test it. We'd fail a master node, we'd test it. We'd fail two worker nodes, two master nodes, a whole failure domain, you know, shut down half the cluster unexpectedly and, and, and we test, test and test and we found lots of problems and we partnered with Docker very closely uh, and, and worked through these problems in our Docker data center environment and solved, I think, 95% of them. There might be one still outstanding uh, that, that nobody's able to replicate. 
Um, but uh, we, we also did that old school because we wanted to hand that spreadsheet off to our colleagues in operations and in other parts of engineering and say, hey, you go run this stuff. We're going to break it. You run it. You know, and you come back to us with the results and tell us if, if uh, the, the system was resilient or not. And that gave them an opportunity to just kind of get in there with Docker at the command line, doing stuff and getting familiar with the tooling, which was extremely helpful. Um, and then the final, the final goal was just to list out, you know, what are the command lines and expectations for everything that we wanted to do and see um, so that we could capture that and one day automate it. And then we didn't automate it, at least not then. And then we did this cool thing. Um, we held war games. So shall we play a game? Uh, during our operational handoff, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute too because that was crazy, but we held war games where we uh, basically had our ops folks off doing their ops stuff and we were somewhere else and we did not sit together and we did not telegraph what we were going to do. This was pre-production. And we just went in and broke the environment in clever ways. And based on our alerting system, which was based on Prometheus, we expected our ops folks to identify the problem, react to the problem, and resolve the problem. And that was a learning curve, and we did it over a course of about a week, I think. And we went and we documented everything while we were doing it, and the ops guys were giving us feedback and saying, hey, this alert could look better, you know? It could be worded a little differently, or that alert could maybe fire a little bit faster because we had two nodes down for 15 minutes, you know, um, when, you know, really we would only want two nodes down for five minutes. To be honest, though, um, our alerting system today, probably in, in, our, in our production Docker environment, probably alerts and informs our operations folks faster and closer to real time than, than what they're already accustomed to. So uh, we made some good progress there. As part of those war games, they learned a whole lot. Uh, and, and it was invaluable experience for those folks uh, as they moved forward and, and as we partnered with them to operationalize this environment. And then finally, I'm going to kind of come full circle. Um, because I was talking about old school and the spreadsheet and, you know, maybe we wanted to automate this. Just last week, we figured out there's a tool called BATS, which probably half of everybody here already knows about. But we didn't because, you know, we don't know everything. Um, and it's a BASH-based automated um, testing tool. And I thought, you know, this might be a good idea to use to help automate our stuff so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of our daily stand-ups last week, and it was like week one of the sprint, which unfortunately coincided with spring break in Wake County, North Carolina, so there was almost nobody there. Um, I said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, try this tool BATS and see if we can't take our previous um, you know, spreadsheet with all the tests in it and automate that. And I set aside like two days. I'll spend two days on this. And it blew me away. It took me about an hour and a half to automate our whole entire test suite in this system called BATS, which is on GitHub. You can just go to GitHub and BATS if you don't know what it is. Um, and uh, I thought, wow, this is awesome. I can't believe that I just, you know, automated what took somebody an hour and a half of typing and messing around. You know, um, now it runs in, in, in less than three minutes, and it's totally great. Uh, we added in a whole bunch of new tests because we're finally on swarm mode. Um, so now we've got about 45 tests in a, in a test suite that we're going to start maturing as we go forward. Another story is to ensure success make sure that you have a demo environment ready to go at any time. Um, and this slide wasn't in here until early this week uh, or maybe over the weekend. Um, and the reason it's here is because we did this really good, but we also dropped the ball on it a little bit. Um, we had a great demo environment and we would stand it up in front of our executives all the way up to the CIO. I don't remember if we presented this to the CEO or not, but I remember I, I'd been at the company for two and a half months and I was sitting in the room with um, our CIO demonstrating this, this environment that we were promising we were going to take to production in another two and a half months. And we would go in and we would have a whole spiel where we went through basic Docker stuff. Um, and then we would, we would put up Prometheus and Grafana in particular because Grafana was eye candy that everybody just latched onto uh, and loved. And we had Grafana instrumented so that pretty much in real time it would show you what was happening in the environment. And then we would have our application development representative bring up our tool, bring up our application, and, and start sending data to it. And he would show a Hystrix dashboard uh, with the uh, responsiveness of that application. And then we would go in in front of our CIO and we would shut a node down. 
And then Grafana would start wiggling around and you'd see a node drop out of the cluster and you'd see the application services drain a little bit but then redistribute and pop back up and that was a really compelling thing. Um, and then the Hystrix dashboard wouldn't even show a blip in terms of application responsiveness and traffic and it was amazing. And that sold so many people on what we were doing. Um, just last week we had uh, a CIO that's part of, um, part of MetLife but a CIO in a foreign country come and we were doing a, a demonstration for him, the, pretty much the same demo, well that was more like a month ago. Um, and you could just see his eyes pop open when we showed him, look, we're going to start breaking nodes in the environment and this application is going to heal itself and it's going to survive and, and nothing's going to happen. And then he got his cell phone out and he took a selfie of the Grafana dashboard and uh, it, was, it was crazy. Um, today we don't have a healthy demo environment and today um, we're presenting a demo in a foreign country. And this is why I put this slide here because we, don't, we didn't have one ready to go today and we should have. Uh, or at the very least, we should have had one recorded which we also do not have. So this is a lesson to learn for us um, and a to do is to both record a good demo and have one ready to go uh, all the time. Training was a big deal for us. This was a story that we invested a lot of time in. Um, we spent a week training our operations folks and some of the things we learned here is that operations folks are really, really busy and they're probably not going to come to training. They're going to think, oh, this is just another thing I'm going to support and, you know, I'll figure out how to support it when it gets here. Um, I literally presented to an entire auditorium with nobody in it. Uh, the monitoring stuff that uh, I had contributed to. Now having said that, in all fairness, there were people on the phone. Um, they were, um, I think, mostly um, offshore folks, but I'm not sure because they didn't talk a lot. Um, but I think, you know, the, the, the story here is expect the unexpected. Expect that you're going to put a lot of effort into doing the right thing and then not everybody, you know, may step up and actually take you up on that offer. Eventually they're going to come back around, um, I can assure you, and say, hey, we need training. And you'll say, but, but we gave you training, a whole week of training. And, and you know, they'll, yeah, well, we were busy and had stuff to do. So plan your training, execute your training well, and then plan to do it again, just like testing. Train, 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 and then train some more. And we're still getting through that, but it's good. Operational handoff was um, something for us. Um, I characterized it as when an unstoppable force meets an immovable object. And we underestimated it. And my guidance would be don't underestimate it. Now I'm, you know, talking about a really big company which has really mature operational processes and procedures and very strict and explicit ways of doing things and they expect a lot when they're, you know, intaking a new tool, a new tool or application for operations. So we're not only giving them a new application, we're giving them a new application running as a microservice in an environment they've never seen before, monitored with tools that they've never seen before. Our logging application had not been operationalized as well. So everything we were giving them was brand new. And then, thankfully, they decided to put together a whole new operational onboarding process for us at exactly the same time. So we just hit head to head and clashed. It was, it was hilarious because, um, you know, we tell the story, um, we're going we're gonna to do all the checks and balances that we're, what you've always done and everything is exactly the same as it's always been except it's all brand new. And that was from the operations folks because they were doing this new thing. So we went to one of our first meetings and, or maybe the second one and they'd gone through and checked all this stuff and they colored full sheets of paper red for us and, and uh, it was quite alarming. But we ultimately came together and, and we got it done. Uh, it was not easy. But, you know, we've operationalized uh, our application now uh, in partnership with our ops folks and, and, and as I, part of my title is it's in production. So there's a few things I'm not covering. Uh, I'm not covering microservices impact on, my, on, on infrastructure and Aaron touched on this a little bit. We think we're realizing in some cases up to 70% reduction in infrastructure costs as a result of this model that we're moving forward with. We're deploying both uh, in the cloud in, domestically and we've got on-prem um, deployments in the pipeline uh, for, foreign, for foreign countries uh, coming up. We've just finished 
turning one to production uh, a week or so ago. I haven't talked much about security. Uh, it's not an area that I'm pro as competent in, um, but certainly we've got experts working uh, on the security of our environment. Uh, I haven't talked a lot about cloud infrastructure and only a little bit about CI, CD. Uh, we're using Prometheus for monitoring and we really like it. Um, we're also looking at alternatives. We continue to keep our options open and we continue to go back and look at what we've done and do an introspective on it and a retrospective and figure out, well, you know, do we want to keep doing that or, you know, how can we make that better? Persistent storage, I was just speaking with uh, somebody in the audience before, is um, the elephant in the room, in my opinion. Uh, and, and it has been for us, you know, how do we handle persistent storage? And we cheat. Um, we don't do it the right way. I'm not sure there is a right way uh, or a way that works for everybody. We chose not to go with more complexity like FluentD or anything like that. I'm sure it's wonderful stuff, but um, we, we went, you know, basically um, a much less complex route. Uh, so, and I found out that elephants and whales are related, by the way. They're both called, they're both in the order ungulate. I didn't know that. So, um, interesting tidbit of information. Uh, another question that we'll be adopt, uh, uh, addressing as we move forward, um, particularly over the next few months, is what should be in containers and what shouldn't be in containers. We put everything in containers that we could, um, which was just about everything. Uh, we've got um, MongoDB in a container. Does that make sense? You could argue yes. You could argue no. Um, we've got our API gateways in a container. Does that make sense? You know, we'll see. It's something we need to go back and look at, and I'm not sure that we know um, what the right answer is or, you know, if there's a one, one answer fits all approach there. And a few other things popped out. We challenged the status quo, and ultimately we were rewarded for that. It was tough as we moved through that process. Uh, it was tough convincing people, you know, we're doing the right thing and, you know, we just want to partner with you and make sure we get this done. But ultimately we did and, and it paid off for everybody and it paid off for the whole organization. We put together a team of equals that thrived and that loves working together. And I think universally, universe, universally looks forward to coming into work every day and solving problems and making decisions and figuring out, you know, what our strategy is going forward in real time. Uh, we're building a renewed interest in open source at MetLife. That's a bit of a slower burn, but we're working on that. Uh, one of my colleagues is here today that, uh, or two of them actually, that uh, I'm, I'm working together with on suggesting open source compliance and governance models, and we're really excited about that. We planted the seeds of a DevOps mindset and transition. Different folks on the team would probably rank our maturity there differently. I, you know, I think we have a long way to go, but we're going in the right direction, and I'm really excited about that. Chat ops was a really cool one, um, and I feel particularly close to this one because um, on the first day that I started at MetLife, I said, what do you guys use for group chat, for collaboration? And they said, we use Microsoft Link. And I said, no, no, I mean group chat. What do you use for collaboration? What do you use to, you know, you know, automate and do stuff and make, make things cool. And they said, Microsoft Link, I don't know, what are you talking about? And I said, okay, you know, w we need a group chat tool. And I'm, you know, and I'm telling you, we're gonna need it because of the way this team is going to operate. Uh, it will be invaluable. And everybody sort of scratched their heads and I had to talk about it for a few weeks. But ultimately, we got a group chat tool in that we use and it has, uh, you know, I, I can't say skyrocketed, but it has really taken off and we've, we've had people step up and finally the lights went off and everybody's like, oh, I get this. I understand this now. And our team, they, they have it installed on their phone. If alerts go off in any of our environments, their phones are pinging. We had um, one engineer start building chat bots and next thing I know, we're in front of executives demonstrating um, integration from uh, a chat tool into ServiceNow, you know, we're able to interact with the Docker environment from chat, and this was all new to MetLife. Um, and I was the one that had originally scratched my head because it wasn't new to me uh, based on, on my background, and I was so excited that I was able to kind of plant that seed and watch other people pick it up and, and, and grow that plant. And then, finally, I come full circle on the whole storming and norming thing because we built this team. We said, go out, break the rules, do things different, figure out how to do this in five months. And along the way, you know, there was, as I said, some, some storming, but ultimately everything 
mostly, normed out, and we got the executive recognition, and we had their support all along the way, but the, the recognition for the team um, was amazing at the end of that five-month period. I'll have a quote in a moment. I actually am not going to talk to this slide because um, somebody said something to me yesterday that I think is even better. MetLife had a baby last year, and that baby is microservices and Docker, and right now that baby is a toddler. And hopefully I get to come back next year and talk about how that baby uh, has changed the way we do business at MetLife and is the teenager maybe, um, or maybe at least an adolescent. Um, but you know, we, we tackled legacy problems, we tackled it with cutting edge technology, we tackled it by partnering with Docker and by moving aggressively to microservices and containers. We completely embraced disruption to get there, but that's what let us get there in five months. That's what enabled us and empowered us. And finally, this is not attributed because I just got it last week. Um, the team got it. And I, I didn't want to run this presentation through content review again. So this is an unattributed uh, executive uh, C star quote, you are, you and the wider team collectively defined a new model for collaboration that not only helped address a critical challenge for MetLife, but one that we will look to deploy more broadly across GTO, GTO being global technology and operations at MetLife. And that team should be extremely proud of that recognition and the change that they were able to make and the culture shifts that they were able to bring to the table for MetLife. And I think it's going to be huge. I think it's going to be successful. And I'm really excited to share um, all of that with, with you. So five months, an idea and a plan, and we made it to production. Thank you. Thank you, thank you also for taking time out of your day to come and, and listen to this, uh, this story. Uh, if anybody would like to talk to me about any of this, I'd be more than happy to get together. Um, and so, yeah, thanks. All right, great. Thanks, Tim. There, uh, are you going to be here a few minutes if people yeah. want to come up and chat? Uh, we're roughly out of time, uh, but feel free to rate the session in the <coughs> and have a great rest of the day.